Hi, everybody. Welcome to Good News in Parks. Um, we are joined today. Jody will be here in just a second, so ignore that blank screen. She just had to run and do something. Um, but we are super excited to be welcoming you today to a much awaited episode of the show where we will discuss advancing equitable usage to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Maya Angelou once said, it is time for parents to teach young people early on that diversity, with diversity, there is beauty and there is strength. And our park and recreation teams are doing that every day, focusing on ensuring communities are diverse and share an understanding of importance of diversity and equity and inclusion with both an internal focus to promote hiring practices that help ensure a diverse team, um, and also externally so that all people feel welcome and included in our parks. That's what Jody and I are here to discuss today with some amazing leaders in the field who will share their insights both locally and nationally. Jody, will you introduce our esteemed guests and let us know what's happening in national news today? Absolutely. Good afternoon to everyone or good morning. Lorena Wheeler, we are so excited to have you on the show. Director of City of Ferndale, Michigan Parks and Recreation Department. She is currently serving on the National Recreation and Park Ethnic Minority Society as a board member representing the Great Lakes region. She is also a certified parks and recreation professional and a certified aquatics facility operator. She works as she has worked as an environmental specialist project manager for the city of Detroit prior to joining her current city. And she also owns her own business, One Life Fitness. Lorena, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And also Jonathan Jones, Commissioner of Recreation, Youth and Workforce Service, City of Albany, New York, Parks and Recreation Department. Prior to joining City of Albany, Jonathan worked as an education uh, specialist and managed the STEM program in low performing districts areas of New York State Education Department. Big job. <laughs> he also worked with Eastern Suffers, B-O-C-E-S, I have to ha go through that one, as a school planning coordinator. He also serves on the board of directors of the Albany Community Action Partnership and also with the 15 Love Capital Regional Program using tennis, the sport of tennis, as a connector and educator tool with youth. Well, we've been, we've been trying to get you for a little while, Jonathan. Welcome to the show. And obviously, you're surrounded by female leaders. So yeah. you, you have guts. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm in great company. And it's a pleasure to be here with y'all. Fantastic. Dr. Autumn Saxon Ross, Vice President of Education and Chief Equity Officer, National Recreation and Park Association, Ashburn, Virginia, at the home office. Uh, I know we're virtual, but she's at the home office. She was a regional director as a DNI lead for Natural Bridge the largest educating partner, now think about that, largest education partner with the National Park Service, huge. She was also the, an educator with the DC Public Schools and program specialist with the DC Park uh, Department of Health. She is also uh, the past assistant director for health and, and with Washington Parks and People organization. And she is the founder and past program director for Green Space for DC. Autumn, welcome back to the show. We're so excited to have you. Thanks, and I think it's just been uh, about a year since I um, first got here, so it's nice to be back. Uh, we can't wait. Yes, it has been too long. <laughs> and also, let's just jump into good news, national news. We are rising up for Parks and Recreation during NRPA's Park and Recreation Month. For more information to be that advocate for your Parks and Recreation, go to nrpa.org. And for more information materials to spread that word and celebrate this month. But you know what, it's not too late. We're gonna celebrate from now on. And then also tomorrow is actually Park and Recreation Professional Day. Please thank your local parks and recreation professional and tell them you appreciate what they're doing for you and your community 
running those facilities, those programs and offering health and, and wellness every day. And they are working their hearts out. So please do so. And then also USTA is gonna hold a United States Tennis Association is gonna hold a community webinar on July 21st and really focusing on parks and partnerships. They're also gonna share tennis and pickleball layouts to try to help communities. Plus they're gonna also talk about free design services and funding opportunities for these facilities. So go to usta.com and search in the USTA slash CTA webinars, and you will find a list of webinars that will help you with your department and agency. Reminding everyone, get on that because August 5th, 5th is a deadline for the NRPA conference in Phoenix, Arizona. So we hope to see you there. Can't wait. It's going to be great. And so make sure that you, you get on nrpa.com or .org to make sure that you can register for that conference and make that deadline of that early bird registration. And then finally, something off kind of, it's on our topic today, but you might not think about. Go to your local chamber of commerce. I've done this with Billings, Montana, where I live now. And I went looking up, how are they engaging in DNI? What I found is Chambers of Commerce have some help for you. Go there. They're not only helping business with DNI development and training, but I actually find they have a full committee that's working with their chamber work and they're working on public initiatives. So take advantage of this. If you want any more information about that, go to the National Chamber of Commerce.com website, or I'll just let you know you can go to Billings, Montana. Chamber of Commerce, and you will see their DNI committee and their network and what they're doing. So I don't know if we always think about that. We work with our Chambers of Commerce when we're, we're uh, active professionals in our communities, but make sure you take advantage of that. All yeah, right. Let's, you are, let's, you are uh, shaking it up in Billings too, aren't you? I'm telling you, I, I we're going you to are. town. I have a Partners for Parks meeting this afternoon. We are working to fund and yes, we are rocking. <laughs> And also, let's just go ahead and jump into this question. And again, thank you panelists for your valuable time on this. This is so important. Let's dive right in. Advancing equitable usage relates related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Lorena and Jonathan, first off, what does that look like in your community? And Autumn, what does that look like nationwide? So let's start with you, Lorena. Why don't you just jump right in and lead us off on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, really for our community, for the city of Ferndale is truly listening, taking action and let that action be known. Um, so we started listening, we, we started doing community surveys, we started doing event surveys. You know, at the, end, at the end of the event survey is, how do you feel it was inclusive? Um, what can we do better to make this event more inclusive? We also hired outside agencies to lead facilitated meetings with the community to help us learn more about real experiences, challenges, and perspectives from members of our community so we can really truly understand. Um, Ferndale has, always been known to be very inclusive, but more so as it relates to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, we are a majority mm -hmm. white community um, and we have the stigma sometimes of not being as welcome or inclusive to others mm -hmm. outside of LGBTQ plus. And so, um, and in addition to that, our parks weren't accessible. You know, we don't have, we didn't have ADA paths and universally designed equipment. So we took action and we made a change. Our city council um, goes above and about, uh, above and beyond to really try to make a more equitable uh, usages of our departments, our parks, um, our city to show that we are just truly taking strides to be more inclusive and, and, and DEI uh, uh, in what it encompasses. Um, so we reestablished partnerships. We um, made new improvements in our parks. Um, we have we 
that actually represent the community's current needs, not what we used to have or want 20, 30 years ago, but we're currently making those adjustments now and we're making our parks more diverse. For example, um, we just installed a new skate park a few years back, um, which is one of our main assets. You can go there any day and it's like a melting pot of just users from different ages, abilities, um, spectators, you know, um, races. And originally the skaters felt out of place. When people think of skateboarders, they think of 70s and 80s, you know, people skating in pools and graffiti and just running around the neighborhood causing havoc, you know, but um, we actually worked with the community and made a design for the skate park that was fitting in our park um, and as well aesthetically and, and fun. And now it's one of our most successful assets that we have in our city that's always talked about. And we introduced the community to skate culture and now they understand it and what it's all about. And we have events that's, that's, that's very popular. We have our um, gravity skate park and gravity art fair and skate contest, which is just sought after every year now. And in addition, we, um, our city council, like I mentioned, is very active in making change and being going beyond um, being vocal on our stance for DEI. They've taken strides to include a, a, a declamation of commitment to anti-racism and racial equality. Um, we observed Juneteenth. We, um, they've made a, it a priority for our parks to meet, be more inclusive and accessible. Um, we recently kicked off the Juneteenth weekend um, this year with the movie in the park series where we featured uh, the Aretha Franklin movie, Respect. And we had city council there as well as other um, city representatives who spoke at the event, you know, about Juneteenth and what the city's, city is doing right now to be more inclusive and diverse. Um, each department in our city were required to take a, a training on equity and inclusion. Um, where we had 90 days to come up to look at some of our programs and 90 days to come up with a change or how we can be more inclusive and diverse in what we're offering and a long-term plan. And that just helped assist the city with making policy changes and, and how we do business uh, on the daily. Um, we also try to be more inclusive by not charging resident fees to our, our city, our, our sister communities. We, we're a very small town. We're less than 20,000 in population and we're surrounded by other small cities as well. So we try to make our services inclusive to them as well. And they do the same for us. Um, Ferndale has been working to have a more diverse workplace, making our parks more inclusive and universally designed um, by adding the walking paths and different universal amenities. Um, and we've been really trying hard to break down that image that has historically been associated with Ferndale to show that we are a city that welcomes diversity and we're equitable and inclusive for everyone. Um, and we feel through our messaging and our internal changes and policies, um, honoring holidays and making proclamations and supporting different movements that the message is clear that um, we've championed advancing equitable uses. Well, I think that what's fantastic, and, and it, the key is you have a plan. You have A to Z. You, you have really done some self-perspective and internal, really looking at your soul of your, your community. Way to go. Thank Excellent. You. Jonathan, take it away on this one. Yeah, and you know, sort of like what Lorena was saying, um, even though her population is about a fifth of ours, uh, we have just under 100,000 people we share in some of the same exercises and the same intentional uh, direct connections with the people. So for example, right now we're in the midst of uh, a charrette series um, survey where we're replacing a pool that was designed in 1931. It has not been redesigned since 1931. And it's historic, uh, it's the Lincoln Park pool. We have two concepts that we're allowing the people to make a vote on. There's two ways of doing that, right? So we talk about inclusive, right? Not everyone can go on technology and make a vote through a website. So when people come to the pool, we're also using the old school style of a vote with a sticker. Um, that's a way we've started in 2014 under our mayor, Kathy Sheehan, um, who was the first female mayor in the second charter, oldest charter city in the United States, the capital of New York State, Albany, uh, to be a mayor. And when she came in in 2014, I was one of her first picks um, and in that process, she created what we call the equity agenda. 
And that looks at every intentional design, every intentional project with the lens of how is this serving all people? Um, and, and not just serving all people um, in that particular neighborhood, but how is that equitable from an investment we made in a neighborhood that is on the other side of the city? And so that's one example of the way we've done that uh, through those charrette style and those surveys. But I'm fortunate to be not only the commissioner of recreation, but also a youth and workforce. And so having youth voice was another intentionality um, and making sure that their voices were heard. A lot of times we had adults making decisions for young people and those adults were not the users of that equipment or of that experience. And so having the young people, uh, having their voice be uh, a part of our decision-making has been important. And then at the same time, being transparent with our process. Um, you know, when I came into 2014, uh, like Lorena was saying, our parks were not in, in the shape of being ADA compliant. Mm -hmm. um, some of our programming was targeted only towards kids. And we didn't really have things for our, our population over 55. And so just this past year, we put in our budget for uh, a position that's gonna allow, uh, you know, to perpetuity, uh, a senior services coordinator that can help our population over 55 also enjoy recreation. I think we learned a lot over COVID that um, humans are meant to be social, even if that is in a distant way. Uh, but we have to use our parks and our resources because quite frankly, we are on the front line of, line of quality of life services, right? So uh, police, fire, and recreation are the things that people can see if it is working or if it is not working for the most part in every city. And so uh, for our staff and for our team, I'm fortunate to have a diverse staff of people. I thought that was important as well because we need to um, hire from the community we serve in order to really have an intentional uh, participation rate and at the same time to have understanding what's happening on the ground in real time. And so those are just some ways we've tried to be more inclusive. Uh, we've tried to be more diverse, even me. Uh, I took this job as a 30 year old black man. Uh, there was never one beforehand. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, kudos to the mayor to taking a shot. But <laughs> at the same time, she saw value. And I think her lens and our administration lens is not to just see value in what is on paper, but to see value in lived experiences, see value in, in also insight, right? You have to have a diversity of insight. So it's not just diversity in race or uh, sexual orientation, it's also a, diverse, a diversity in thought. And that's what we pride ourselves on. And we still have a lot of ways to go, but we're making great strides and efforts every day. So proud of you both. This is why you're on this show. You both, I've watched some of your development and look through at different documents of your communities. You have driven this to the guts and the soul of your community. Way to go, both of you. Excellent. So folks, key into them, go look at their information at their departments, it's pretty dynamic. All right, Autumn, tell us what's going on nationally and where do we go from here? Yeah, so it's wonderful to be able to connect with these wonderful leaders uh, across the country. And you know, I just wanna uplift a few things that they said as we talk about like what's happening nationally um you know as i listened to jonathan you know and he talked about um like usage um <clears throat> you know what it looks like nationally and what i tell folks when they're talking about where do we start and how do we start you have to start with knowing what the diversity is in your community right so we lead with race because we recognize that if we can solve what's most difficult and what's most taboo in this country everything else is like a, a, a picnic in the park, correct? So for us, that's what we choose to do because we have the resources. There's someone like me that's leading that work, but we have to recognize that throughout smaller communities, rural communities, communities across the country, right? Diversity looks and feels different. And so as Jonathan talks about, you know, there's diversity in age, there's diversity in needs. There's diversity when we think about, um, you know, folks that are, you know, uh, neuro different. When we think about our LGBTQI um, community, so I always want to talk about and lift up that you have to, you must address the diversity that's within your community first because that starts to prepare you for all the other changes. So right now, maybe the diversity is age and in another 10 years, because something happens, you have a whole new community of new Americans that come. You have started those processes. You started figuring out how to be able to adapt for change because that's all we're talking about. 
diversity, <laughs> equity, inclusion is really all about change. It's taking something that we considered normal and recognizing that there are so many different lived experiences that are normal for others. And how do we put all those together and make sure that folks really feel seen. And so, uh, so happy to hear uh, the work that Jonathan's doing and so happy to see that you all are moving from access to usage, right? Because access is, you know, I can go there now, but do I feel like I belong? Do I see people that look like me? Do I hear someone that I can communicate with because of a different language? And so that we are talking about relevancy. And so Lorena was talking about relevancy, right? Like you have to program as parks and recreation folks, we have to program according to what the community needs, right? We had a wonderful conversation of tennis now it's pickleball, right? And so relevancy, we have these specific examples that we are used to and then apply them in different ways, right? So if we're talking about a program, relevancy can be tennis versus pickleball. But relevancy is also if a community has changed from being majority Black to majority Hispanic, right? And so we always have to keep an eye on that. And so that's why it's so important when we're not just talking about access, we're talking about usage and making sure it is relevant for who is there. And that's the work that we really have to do is to know who is there. And the last piece that I just wanna say naturally that's important is, and both of uh, my fellow guests talked about this a little bit, but lifting it up is policies and process and people. You can't do one or the other. So if you're talking about you're having cultural re relevancy training and you're talking about race and then you do nothing to institutionalize that within your policies and programs, what happens when those people leave? You have to start over. What happens if you put it in policies and programs and then no one understands why it's important and no one has really been able to engage with that and see how it transfers in their programming and transfers in their facilities or maintenance? It's not going to work. And so again, nationally, what we're really trying to get and what works really well is when folks are taking a bit of time on the policies and processes and consistently working with people and doing and training. And that's what we're really trying to do at, um, at NRPA. So just lastly, one specific example that I'm really excited to be able to start to share that I'm learning about in Seattle, they're creating a GIS system for their facilities and maintenance folks. So they have this wonderful GIS system, right? We know that our maintenance folks use the asset management, right? We have these assets, how do we manage them? Where do we go, right? So that's the kind of like policies and tech and processes. So they've created this GIS that they have. They've overlaid it with race, social income data with their parks. They've used their asset management software to now see how, many, how much maintenance is happening in the park according to the communities those parks are in. So now we can see how much money and how those, manage, those assets have been managed differently according to where those parks are, right? Because we know maintenance and facilities are managed different depending upon where. And why is that? It's because we know some communities feel comfortable calling in and saying, hey, something's wrong. Some communities recognize how to engage with cities and government and people to get things done, whereas other communities aren't engaged. They don't speak the language. So this is an example of the technology that they're using. Now what they're doing is training their folks on using the system, right? They are leading with customer service. How do we uh, make connections with people in the community so they feel comfortable telling me when something's wrong or asking me for something else, right? And then when those calls are coming in for asset management, how do we prioritize, use the system and be like, you know what? I was just at that park last week to do something. Oh, this park on this side of town hasn't been maintained or visited in three weeks. Let me make sure I go there first and then finish this call. So for me, that's a perfect example of um, kind of this idea of both, right? Policies and processes, mm -hmm. because who has to follow those people? So it's a perfect example of thinking about equity and usage, but making sure that we're thinking about the technology and the policies and making sure people are connected and understand how to use those. You know, that is a great example because think about it. You are encouraging engagement. You are making sure there's a resolve. And if uh, nothing else, you're creating trust. And what a great system. Thank you for giving us that because I had not heard about that. 
So that's wonderful. Thank you, Autumn. All right. I'm going to turn it over to you, Anne-Marie, for our first poll. Yeah, and you guys have set up this first poll question so well, um, because we, we've got two today, and we're going to look at it both internally and externally. So the first question that we're asking everybody is think about your current internal DEI efforts and what do they include? And let's kind of talk about the difference between those first two. Currently developing means you're working on it. It is not, you don't have the full conduit connected. And what we mean by that is if you're selecting number two, we already have a DEI policy in place. You're talking about what Autumn was just speaking about, that it's not just one guy in the department who has some knowledge and is doing some research. It is fully implemented across your parts. You're feeling really good about it. You're getting good feedback from the community, really thinking about what that policy in place means versus kind of working on and developing some. And I just saw somebody change the vote, so that's great. Um, the third one, collecting demographic data on staff volunteers in the community to ensure that your staff reflects the diversity of the community. Super important, right? So have you done that exercise? Um, we have a dedicated team member for DEI research policy and implementation. I know that's a challenge in smaller communities um, as opposed to larger communities, but is there somebody that is spending a you know, good portion of their time within your department um, on that particular initiative? Um, do you hold periodic training on DEI to ensure inclusive language and respectful interactions, not only in your department, but with the communities that you serve? Or is it something else? And again, there are so many ways to approach this. So, um, you know, obviously we cannot get everything in a, in a Zoom poll question. So if there's something else that you're doing out there um, to promote DEI efforts within your department internally, please just check that and then put it in the chat. Um, so that we can share it with everybody and let them know some of the great things that are happening out there. A um, lot, <laughs> lot of diversity within the voting here, I will say. We're going to give you guys about five more seconds. Um, you can choose as many. This is a multiple choice, so choose as many um, as apply. Most of our questions are multiple choice unless there's a very specific thing that we're asking. So um, feel free to check more than one if you've got more than one going on in your department. And we'll go ahead and end that poll. And we will share out the results with everybody. So this is great. Um, holding periodic training uh, to ensure inclusive language and respectful interactions. Um, almost 50% of the viewers out there are doing that. And um, so that's the most popular answer. Um, collecting demographic data on the staff in the community to ensure that reflection is our uh, also, you know, very popular answer. 42% of you said you have a DEI policy in place. That is Fantastic, really fantastic. 24% mm -hmm. so are still developing and crafting that policy. Um, and we did have a few people say something else. So if that is um, your selection, go ahead and share that in the poll. And um, when we get to another poll question, we'll go ahead and share your answers out with everybody. So thank you so much for taking part in that. We'll get back with another poll question um, in just a second. Jody? All, all right, question number two. Okay, panelists, we kind of got two parts here. So. Jonathan Lorena, what type of DNI communication, 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 and materials are your agencies using to make sure the word gets out uh, to the general public and that all persons feel welcome and supported upon their usage and engagement with your local parks, recreation programs, and facility offerings? And part the second part is for Autumn. Autumn please discuss the tools and supporting materials that are out there for agencies to support the DNI efforts, especially with NRPA's tools kits. So looking forward to listening to that. Jonathan, start us off on this. How are you communicating and what's out there to get that word out? Yeah, so I, I talked about um, the two separate ways we're doing the one project, right? So mm -hmm. physically at the site and then again on the social media site. But we have something in our city called C Click Fix. And C Click Fix allows any person that sees a problem to take a picture of it and it comes directly to the department on an issue. So, for, say for example, in their park, um, there's a swing that has been damaged. Right away, they can take a picture from their phone, right? And then write in the description where that issue is. It comes directly to our department. And then we have on our metric system. Um, to be able to see, and the mayor has a dashboard to see how long it takes us to respond, what actions we're taking, and then which departments we have to work with to get that job accomplished. That is something that 
for me is very unique because again, it's talking about transparency. Every resident can see. And quite frankly, uh, before our administration got here, I can be honest to tell you that there were times if you lived in a certain part of, you know, Albany, it was just, if it was broke, it get fixed when they came to it. And now it's like, it's an expectation that if it's broke, it will be fixed. And on top of that, if it is not fixed, everyone in the city can transparently see that you have not done it in, in such times. So that is one platform we used. Um, another is um, for our registrations. Um, we use a, a civic rec system um, for registrations that has allowed um, number one, environmentally for us to reduce the amount of paper that we're holding. Um, and then secondly, um, it, it takes away some of the issues that we were having with record keeping and collecting. So we can ask some questions. Um, so for example, in our summer camp, this year we used something called the HOPE scale. And that was just uh, to, to understand from our young people how they were dealing with everything we're all dealing with. How did they feel hopeful in their life? How did they feel about you know, coming into our centers, is it a safe space? Um, are you safe in the places you go? And that was just different for us because I'm a sociologist, a uh, trained sociologist, but at the same time, I'm a parent and I have two, two children. And so to see my kids deal with the pandemic in a way that I don't know how they're even going through it with hybrid school and so on and so forth, some of our young people didn't have that outlet or that parental involvement to be able to ask them, you know, intently, how are you feeling today? Right, and more importantly, we're using that platform because it allows us to communicate with the parents as well in a, in a sensitive way, but at the same time have some data so that as we're working with the young person as they grow, if we needed to connect them to a mentor or if we needed to connect them to a particular sport. Um, last example I make, I do jujitsu. And as doing jujitsu, you learn that when you get down on the ground, the fight is not over, right? And in doing that and sharing that with young people, um, some of our young people that are acting out just need to go to boxing. We have a boxing gym and just throw a couple punches, get that anger out instead of deflecting that energy uh, to something that could be illicit or put them in a bad situation. And so those are some of the platforms we're using. Um, again, it, all credit goes to my team. These people work tirelessly to make sure that our community has what they need. And uh, that's where we are here in Albany. Well, <laughs> You've come a long way because I used to be a community development trainer in, in the state of New York and with yes. the state of New York, and you have come so far for engagement. And so thank you for, you, you're not just sitting in the office, you're actually in the field. So Jonathan, thank you for going out there and being with those youth. It's an amazing job you're doing with them. All right, it. let's go to Lorena. Yeah, so Jonathan, we also use Secret Fix the same way that you do, so <laughs> yeah, right. so that's great. <laughs> um, so I think, like I mentioned earlier, it's very important to not only take action, but let those actions be known. And Ferndale recognizes that, and that's why we work very hard to make sure our messaging, messaging is clear to our community and that we are getting the messaging out. Um, our residents are very active. Um, they, they create their own Facebook groups. I mean, I can't even tell you how many Facebook forms or groups that we have for the dog park, for the skate park, for rats, for, you know, they, they're, they're there. So um, it's great because they're vocal and we can actually see what they're saying and, you know, provide feedback and make adjustments where we need necessary as well. But one of the things, like I said, um, it's important for, to know, for them to know the actions that we're taking. And I think um, our city council has really shown that by, like I mentioned, their declarations through the public meetings. They don't just say on their own pages or in speeches, you know, this is what I stand for. They're actually making declarations and proclamations for different things like the anti-racism and racial equality, um, celebration of Juneteenth, um, raising of the Pan-American flag for Black, Black History Month. Um, and again, taking strides to make our parks more inclusive and welcoming for all. So some of the things that um, we double down on to make sure that that's known is, of course, by using our um, face, very popular Facebook pages, um, as well as we have a new Instagram account. We try to re-emphasize what we're doing through our local cable channels and, of course, our websites. You can find all this information through our website, clicking on the links. We talk about 
the anti-racism. We talk about the Pan-American flag. We talk about um, the, the three pillars that we've taken to actually um, really put forth our commitment to anti-racism, whether it's from the engagement to the, from with the community to um, what we're doing internally, um, as well as other things. And, and we also have a quarterly newsletter that goes out to every resident that we send as well. Um, in addition, we have a communications guide that's distributed to all of our staff. And that guide emphasizes inclusive and welcoming language that we need to use. So we can basically be putting messaging out cohesively as a city. Um, so everybody knows what the city stands for as a whole. Um, and, you know, we've just really been active in doing that. Uh, we respond to all our Facebook pages. We have a lot of human interactions. So whenever we're out and about, we do our surveys, we ask, we talk to people. We want to know how do you like our programs? What do we need to change? What don't you like? And it's great that we are getting that, that honest feedback. Um, we also have our boards and commissions that have been very active. And because I think because of the, the, the direction the city's been taking over the last few years as it relates to DEI, we've been getting a lot more community volunteers in our boards and commissions, not right. people that just sitting there and you know, want to have that on, on their resume, but really being involved and taking initiative and using their skills to help the cities further their, our goals. Um, and we've started our Ferndale Accessibility and Inclusion um, Committee as well. So that's a, a board through our, that's appointed through our city council. And for our department, we work very closely with them when we're doing park improvements, or if we need to get certain messaging out to, um, people with you know, some type of uh, disability that we feel we can't reach. And then of course our park board who has been very active and in helping us reach the community. They, during one of our meetings, the board actually took the initiative to start a parks equity, equity subgroup. So we're working through them so they can help us you know, from the volunteer and the community perspective to see how can we make our parks more equitable and inclusive. So um, those are, I, just, I probably just scratched the surface because we do have a communications team in the city that we work very closely with to make sure that the messaging is out. Well, well, please, anyone on here, <coughs> excuse me, please go to their website. This city does a great job, but this department does a great job of engagement. So I would really encourage you to go to their Facebook, um, golly, I couldn't get on there and stay long enough. So, so I just want to say thank you for bringing it up. And that was really important to our audience with this question from them. Uh, Autumn, bring us back home. Um, you're at that national level. You all have done a fabulous job with some tools. Yeah, so I'll start with just some, some things that are coming up specifically to communications and marketing. Mm -hmm. As, uh, some of you may know, we have a communication and marketing um, cert, uh, certificate. We are prioritizing updating and bringing that into the 21st century. It's, it's, um, it's one of our oldest certificates. So we're prioritizing um, uh, bringing that back so it's a lot more uh, relevant and it has more... Um, um, opportunities for folks to think about DEI as it relates to communication and marketing. So that's something that's happening this year, this, this fiscal year. So this year and half of next year, um, that'll be something that we're prioritizing. I also, um, and so that example I used in Seattle, they use fix it, find it, fix it app. So it's similar <laughs> to the app that you all have. So an example of, you know, so I just want to encourage folks, you all have that app and you have GIS people that work in your city. You most likely can have them pull that information, put it on some social data, um, some data on income and race. And that's really going to help you be able to, uh, to find out even more, pull some data on response rates and be able to have conversations with your staff to say, hey, look, 
what's happening here and how can we go? So it's great to hear about those asset management um, software that folks are using across the country. So of course we had our equi equity language guide that we released um, October, almost two years ago. And so that is a resource that we are continuing to hear and see that folks are using it. And we like to couch that resource as language is never perfect, but language can be better because it's constantly evolving. And so we start off with that. Um, and another big point when it comes to marketing and communication is that, look, you have to follow folks lead, right? If a community member, there is nothing wrong with you asking folks how they identify or how they wanna be referred to, right? So it's always, and so that's how we start with our equity language guide is that all we're trying to say is that we all should do better, right? So it's better language, not perfect language, but then also that you should follow the lead of the community. Whoever you're dealing with, follow their lead. If they refer to their community in one way, have that conversation to make sure that you're in line with that. Um, other toolkits that we have, something that we're really excited about, you know, we've had our webinars, especially around our equity and practice uh, work happening, we've heard from some smaller agencies, especially around their field staff, right? We have our program staff, we have our facilities and maintenance. We want them to look at the gender unicorn webinar that you all had because we're really focusing on LGBTQIA and non-binary folks for our summer camp programs. But all of my people are out when you all are doing your webinars. How can I see that? So we've created a page now for a lot of our equity and practice webinars for agencies to download and use it as a staff training. So an example, that gender unicorn webinar, you can download and show it your all staff and have questions and have conversations. You, one of your department leads can pull that and have conversations. So we're starting to do that in recognition that we are all in this field because we didn't want to sit at a computer, regardless if that's what we do now. The majority <laughs> of our people don't do that. And so oh, really that's so true. Yes, I hate that I am at a computer all the time now because that's why I started in Parks and Rec. But, you know, we have to do what we have to do. And we recognize that since folks don't sit there all the time, how do we make sure it's accessible so that a director can pull this when they have their departmental meeting with their facility staff or when they're training their summer staff? They can have their full-time staff, right, using the same language, having the same training opportunities as their summer or part-time staff. So that's another resource. Um, uh, we are, and you all are probably the first time I'm saying this outside of, <laughs> outside of work, is we, I have been talking about this uh, DEI resource library for like a year and a half now. Right. It launched in August. So that is, Yay! <laughs> that is going, and it is on the website. It is free for everyone, not just members. And so that is a uh, very heavily curated resource of DEI resources, toolkits, podcasts, articles, books and examples for implementation across not just DEI race, uh, you know, marginalized communities, but examples specifically for parks, recreation, and conservation. And so I think right now we're at like about 400 resources. And then you can actually go in and say, I just want to hear a podcast. Like I got some time or, you know, like, hey, my leadership, uh, my leadership team. I want us to start having 15 minutes for DEI every meeting. Hey, what's a good podcast we can start with? Pull the podcast, send it to everyone, and then that's something. And so you all can go in and look specifically around those categories and also look for things specifically around our um, DEI competencies that we're focused on. So if you want to focus on self-awareness, you can find a podcast specifically on self-awareness. If you want to focus on relationships across difference or direct communication, we have the search engine for you to really be in line with how we're building out um, our equity in practice. So I am, uh, it has been a serious thing for websites. I didn't know it was so hard to build skeletons and all that good stuff, but um, that is our newest resource that folks have been asking for directly. Where can I go to find stuff I know I can use and is useful? August 1st. Yeah, we'll be blasting you all's email consistently. Wow. You know, Autumn, now you think about it. You just came to NRPA. And I think you're three years or, or maybe four now, but three years is 
about 20 years of work. So way to go. And folks, we are so lucky because, oh my gosh, I can tell you as a past president of NRPA, this was a dream. We wanted this and we talked about this and it's reality. Thank you, Autumn, for bringing this forward with your team. You're working hard. That is fantastic. Also, Emory, I'm going to turn over your polls, but I also want to um, answer a couple of things. I just had some texts <laughs> and I saw one email real quick. I know I have <laughs> eyes in the back of my head. Bottom line is Allison Rhodes, Director of Boulder, Colorado. Yes, this will be <laughs> on a podcast <laughs> because she couldn't make it today. And then I have another couple. So I'm going to check those while we go to that poll, Anne-Marie. But again, yes, you can get the, the uh, taping of this. So anyway, awesome. thank you all. Great that, job. That is, that, is, that is hard to follow up. I'm just going to say that right now. Oh, my God. Uh, we're going to our, we're go to our next poll question. So let's launch this one. And this one is focused on external efforts this time. So what are your current DEI external efforts? Um, do you have awareness programming aimed at youth? Obviously, making community awareness um, is an important priority, right? Um, do you have it specifically focused at youth or number two, um, aimed at the community at large, more of a general type of, a, of an education and awareness programming? Uh, answer three, marketing campaigns to educate the public about parks as a safe space and commitment to reflecting the diverse community. Do you bring in diverse speakers to share art, education, awareness, or other types of programs? Um, is there a DEI focus land language in your external communications and events. So do you know who's living in the community and do you speak in a language um, that they speak um, so that everybody understands your communications? What about expanding inclusive places and spaces to accommodate different abilities of people or something else? Um, so we'll give you guys a couple of minutes to vote on that one. And while you do, um, just share a couple of something else answers that some folks gave from the first poll question. Um, Lisa Drennan shared that she works with recreation departments to provide disability inclusion training. Um, each different town and city is in a different place regarding you know, where they are in that. So she works with individual communities um, around here to provide that sort of inclusion training. So that's, that's fantastic. I imagine that involves kind of learning where they are and then kind of helping them get to that next place. Um, we also had someone in, you know, speaking about safe space. I, I, I love that somebody felt felt safe enough here in, in our, in our group um, to share that, you know, as it relates to DEI, they're doing a great job with those who are differently abled, um, they spend a lot of time, resources, and efforts on therapeutic recreation, but feels like for race, LGBTQ+, et cetera, they're really missing the mark. Um, they have about a 300,000 person popula uh, mm -hmm. population, and the majority is minority, so feeling the real need to focus there on that larger group. Um, but I will say kudos for, you know, at least starting with differently abled, you're, you know, you're, you're doing something that's, that's awesome, that's fantastic, and um, love that you kind of recognize that next step is to include other groups. And then um, Mary Palacios also shared that um, she checked other for that first question. They do have a small committee working on DEI initiatives um, in parks. So that's, that's kind of great having that committee. All right, so let's take a look at this one. Um, we'll end the poll and share it out with everybody. And it looks like um, expanding inclusive places yes. to accommodate different abilities. <clears throat> Number one, there's certainly a lot of awareness um, you know, out there around that, so that's great. Following closely, very closely behind that is using a DEI focus in language in their external communications and events. Um, uh, DEI awareness programming aimed at the community at large was our third most popular, but um, all the answers definitely received voting. So that's great to hear that there's so many different options and, um, you know, programs going out right now that are expanded toward, uh, toward the external audience to expand DEI in communities. So thank you for taking the time to vote. We'll stop sharing and Jody, I'll turn it back to you for our third question. All right. Third question panelists. Here we go. Jonathan and Lorena, let's go for the local level on this one, and then we will go to Autumn for the national perspective. With, great re with the great resonation that you're hearing, hearing about on news throughout our country, our audience would like to know, how are you attracting, retaining your existing staff at the local level, and 
how are you dealing with this for long term? Are there any type of tips that you could give our audience that are secrets that you're using to make sure that your workforce is diverse? So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jonathan, and then we'll go to Lorena. Um, all right. So things that we're doing, first of all, uh, we're creating an environment where people want to come to work. It's hard working with people. It's ex extremely hard working with people who now have a platform to tell you how bad you are. And so <laughs> burnout is real. Uh, I'm just keeping it real with y'all. Burnout is real. That's real. Um, yes. And I think particularly in our rec recreation department, we've created a culture of family. I spend more time here with these people than I do at home. Um, and so because of that, uh, I have the opportunity to get to know them, not only from a personal perspective, but in a professional way so that they can trust me and trust us. Um, what our city is doing is we're creating a uh, compensation scale because we realize that even though we're part of a municipality that uses a civil service uh, appointment system to bring people into these jobs, so some of them are test-based, um, some of the tests don't reflect what they're going to do on the job, but that's the system we're under. Um, but what we are doing is we're looking at how we're paying people. Uh, I can be honest that our city recognizes that we don't pay enough for people services. What I mean by that is the people who are watching our kids, the people who are providing programs, we don't pay enough. And I have begun to lose people to private businesses um, mm -hmm. that saw the experience, saw the relationships, saw the challenging uh, environments that we worked with. And the people here are problem solvers, right? And so that's gonna be useful in any industry. And we were losing people, right? We're the state capital, so we lose a lot of people to the state. I came from the state, but we lost people to the state, right? And so the biggest way to retain people, I think for us that's been beneficial with our team is the environment that they work under. And then quite frankly, uh, Lorena talked about our holidays, right? We just last year, May Juneteenth, the holiday. Um, that's something that for me in particular, that holiday is important. Um, and at the same time, it's something that uh, some other, other members, what we found where they were taking days off that should have been holidays, for example, to vote. Um, these, these are a right as, a, as an American uh, for us to utilize this space. And then uh, the other thing I would just say is trying to have fun in the job where recreation and our I guess one of my challenges is we work so hard, we never get a chance to promote or have fun. And so last year, a couple a couple years ago now, we started doing like these end of the summer bashes. Um, we're doing things in our community. For example, tomorrow we're hosting something called Play Streets. And what that does is basically it brings a party uh, to our community in, across the city at different uh, spaces, but it also brings resources so that people can know, okay, I need to get my child a physical I don't have a primary doctor right now. That doctor or that company may be at the play streets. And so that type of, I guess, quality of life, um, it's, it's tangible improvements. And when you see that, it makes you feel good. And that kind of keeps people close. Uh, but at the same time, we know we still have some work to do on the compensation side. And then quite frankly, um, just, you know, in our meetings, just try to keep it light. You know, I take our team out on hikes and walks and you know, I do yoga and all this crazy stuff just to keep myself sane. And so I try to incorporate that uh, with our team. But those are just the things, you know, keeping an environment. So many of my colleagues uh, have worked where they've been paid a lot of money, but it was such a stressful environment that the juice wasn't worth the squeeze to stay. And I found that we've been able to keep people. Uh, I've been here nine years. Uh, and for me to be here for nine years, uh, I've seen a lot of ebbs and flows. But at the same time, even for our mayor to retain me, um, it was because of the environments that we offer. Feel the heart, folks, feel the heart. Because <laughs> yeah. we are about people and safe havens and gathering places, feel the heart. Lorena? Yes, um, I agree with everything that Jonathan said. I mean, we, we kind of take the same approach. Um, for Ferndale, though, we, we, I think it's important to have competitive pay. Um, we start all our employees out at part-time employees at $15 per hour, and we also provide them with benefits um, um, 
if they work, you know, over a certain amount of hours and qualify mm-hmm. for it. But we uh, provide that opportunity to them as well, which makes us a little more competitive in the field. Um, we've done recently, we've done salary studies um, to, so we can make changes accordingly to make sure everyone is paid fairly. Um, mm-hmm. We retaining staff, like you said, trying to make it more of a, a family environment. We've always been like that. I mean, we try to be flexible and try to really have that work-life balance. We're in troubling times or we're coming out of troubling times right now. And unfortunately, we still don't have a recreation building. So we're working virtually. Um, so it, that's, that's another challenge, but we aren't loose on our policies, but we are understanding. And, and like I said, believe in that work-life balance. We, we're one big family. We try to make our staff feel comfortable to be themselves. You know, um, we, we really, I really strive on working on their strengths, you know, find out what they like to do. You may like to draw or do art, you may like music. So I want to make sure in addition to what your normal tasks are that you own, that you're able to utilize some of those skills that you have a passion for, you know, what programming can we implement? Or maybe if you like, maybe we can have you help design a flyer if you like drawing or something like that to kind of help build on what they already love to do. Um, I'm very, very big on failing forward. Try it. What's the worst that happen? If, if it doesn't work out okay, that's fine. We won't do it again. But if it does, which normally we do strike gold, then we're going to keep on going. That's you know? right. <laughs> so, and then but to instill that confidence in them to let them know it's okay to try something. You know what I mean? Um, we're not going to, you're not going to get fired because you had this one great idea that just turned left. You know, we have your back, me, my administrative staff, we're there for you. Um, and just continue to encourage them to be, and that helps them be more invested in the department. Um, we like to really, as a city as a whole, and myself personally, train up our staff. You know, what, what mm-hmm. do you aspire to be? Do you want to be director? Do you want to be program manager? What is it? And how can I help you get there? Now, sometimes it backfires to train them up a little bit too much and then they go take another <laughs> job. But, you know, but they, you know, they, they, they give us their best. Um, but normally, you know, they stick with us and we try to place them in a position to where they want to be um, or closer to that position. Um, for attracting staff, um, we found that partnering with our local schools has really, really help. You want to get the, you know, a lot of people don't even think about, I never thought about being in parks and recreation when I was in high school. I didn't even know that was a real job. Mm -hmm. I just went and attended, you know, I was just attended programs, campers there, um, camp counselors, you know, but letting them know what we do and how we do it and giving them an opportunity to be part of that. So we started um, under our deputy director, um, a youth officials program where we actually train the high schoolers to be officials for the youth programs. Um, that's and our and volunteer in our events, assist with seasonal work, which actually led to us hiring some of those high school students part time. Um, and through that relationship, we just kind of opened the doors to the park and rec field and just, you know, um, creating that line of communications and, and awareness so we can in the future, hopefully bring more people into the field in general. And I think it's very important to uh, market yourself. So we are really big on letting people know all the great things that we do. Like, like Jonathan mentioned, all the fun stuff, you know, um, not all the desk stuff all the time, but all the fun stuff. Like this is what we're doing in our parks. This is the new event. Hey, come volunteer. Hey, come, come meet Park and Rec staff. Come out and play with us. You know, um, one year we did come out and play with Park and Rec staff where each staff that had a special interest um, led an event that day. Um, I did, um, I think I did a stroller fitness one day. Then we did um, a strongman competition, but the community version, um, all different types of stuff. So the community can come out and just see what we do. So then when we hire and we put out um, uh, on Facebook, hey, we're hiring for part-time or full-time. People say, you know what? I love Ferndale Parks and Recreation. (laughs) I wasn't even thinking about this type of part-time job, but I'm going to apply. Or they just organically spread the word for us, um, which is great. And then as, a, as 
being a diverse workforce, it's easier to attract a diverse workforce when you already have a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. And my staff is is very divorce. Um, and divorce, sorry, diverse. Hey, we, it, atmosphere. we understood. Uh, <laughs> very diverse. Um, when and when our applicants interview, you know, they see that, mm -hmm. and it sends a message. But for those that aren't that diverse. Um, you have to think of un unconditional ways, untraditional ways to um, market and, and get people involved. Um, it's not always just indeed. That's not always the answer. You know, you may have to work through your local or national parks and recreation association, the boards, the schools and other diverse areas as well. Well, I want to make a comment. Uh, you have a program that you talked about right there that went back into schools and actually engage those high schoolers. And we had a program at Springfield Green County when I was director of, of the city county park system. And we had it with Springfield Public Schools, largest accredited school district in Missouri. They actually gave credit for them to be in a training program with us mm -hmm. and actually eventually being hired on our staff for part-time service. Folks, I hope you'll engage with your school districts and your school systems to really look at that or your private or whatever you have in delineation of education because that it is there and, and it was so successful with uh, Dr. Peggy Riggs living that, leading that as a deputy superintendent. So I just share that. I'm so glad you brought that, Lorena, up because that is an important program and they will give credit to those students. All right, Autumn. Your yeah. best experience, here we yeah. go. So just taking what um, these wonderful, my wonderful uh, panelists have said, right? Recruitment is about relationships, right? Like that's all I'm hearing. You have a relationship with the schools, you figure out that's how you recruit. You have a relationship, you're building relationship with communities, right? And if you are building relationships, right? With an eye and a thought and intentionality and making sure you are equitable and thinking about inclusion and diversity, you have those relationships, that's how people are hired. I, all the jobs that I have totally completely loved have not come from me going to an Indeed. They have come from relationships, either the organization or I have had, and someone being like, hey, this person needs to talk to this person because you would be good for that job, right? And so, uh, you know, what are, things that you can do, you have to build relationships. You have to build relationships with the schools, partnerships, community, because that's how you're going to get folks that really love what you do to be there. The second part with retention, again, DEI lens is relevancy. People are going to stay if what they are doing, what you are doing is relevant to them. And that means there are staff that look like them. They are running programs from their lived experience that relate to folks that look like them. So it's important for us to think about this in a different frame. You don't, don't ask me about recruiting unless you're telling me how you're retaining people. So nationally, that is the message that we're putting out. Don't ask me about recruiting unless you're telling me about how you're retaining folks, right? Because you can recruit diversity all day. And if those these folks come in as the only one or their voice isn't being respected or they're not included, guess what's going to happen? Someone else is going to take them. And so some specific examples that we're seeing across the country and, you know, folks have talked about this, Lorena and Jonathan, but at NRPA, you know, we aren't, we've had so many people leave and so many people come at this point. 48% of our staff has come in the past two years at NRPA. So almost half of our staff have come within the past two years, which is a challenge and a great opportunity. And so we are focusing on culture. And that is how we really think about both retention and um, recruitment, to be honest. And, you know, for me, culture is all the things that you don't necessarily see or do, but it's what surrounds you. And so, and reminding folks, I know as a nonprofit, it's a, it, it's a bit different for us than folks working, you know, for government or municipalities, but you can build culture for free. It doesn't always cost money. So one of the first things that Christine did, um, we had a, a staff um, exercise on identifying and reframing NRPA's values right? So our values are continuous learning, trust, diversity, and inclusion. And so in that, what we do in building culture 
really goes back to those values that all of us had a conversation about and that that is what this organization is. So people feel connected and then we act on those values. So examples, something I personally love, we have no meetings Fridays. Do you know how transformational a no meeting Friday every week is, wow. right? You can sit, you can think, you can answer emails, you can do work, you can do all of that. It is frowned upon if you are bothering people on Fridays, right? That is now a culture thing. No meetings Fridays. Don't <laughs> talk. I mean, of course, leadership, sometimes we have to do it, but it is known that I should not be pestering my staff on Fridays because we all need time to do that. No meetings Fridays. We also on Fridays at 11 o'clock, everyone shuts down and focuses on some type of DEI training personally. So if you had a podcast, if you have a book, if you have an article, if there's something, a movie, something that you wanted to watch to help you personally, individually learn, grow, figure something out, read something every Friday at 11 o'clock, that is what you're supposed to do, right? Those two things are free. Those, and everyone loves it. Um, we also are focusing a lot on relationship building. So Christine once a month holds a munch and learn where there are topics and people can just drop in and develop a relationship with her because we know that organizations follow leadership and the more connection folks have with leadership, right? The more you're gonna tell somebody, hey, Christine, this isn't really working. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't, but now because they've had that relationship, people feel comfortable having conversations with VP or senior leaderships. Um, and you know, to, uh, to piggyback on um, what Lorena talked about, something that has been transformational within the organization is we now commit to every three year, a comprehensive compensation review. And so in that we are constantly looking at equitable pay within the organization across the positions, but also how that then is comparable to the market. And so if we need to adjust every three to four years, we have that information and it is now seen in transparency. Every position we post, you see the salary range. And you know why we can do that? One, people know what they're going to get when they come in, but also all of our staff understands and now sees Oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm a something specialist. That's the range. Yes, that's the range, right? And so th it's this idea, it's no longer this like secret squirrel thing of like, oh, somebody's making more than me. And I'm doing this thing. There are no conversations about that. So people can actually feel comfortable that we respect them, that we value them the same as people that we're bringing in. So people can focus on actually developing relationships and not being like, this person just got here and they make 20,000. No, none of that happens. So transparency. And um, those are just some of the specific examples that we use and something that someone sent me that I absolutely love. And I'm trying to figure out how I can find a budget for this, this cost. But they have a pot of money that they release every month that's called take your coworker to coffee. So you can go to HR and ask for 20 bucks, 50 bucks to take someone to coffee for their birthday or because they're new or because this, and this company has found that that money disappears every month because there are so many people that are taking an advantage of that. And if one of our value, you know, if our values are inclusion, right? And continuous learning, that's a perfect opportunity. So, you know, I say all of that is some, some stuff that we're doing, but a reminder that building culture to retain and attract staff can be free. Just thinking about how you can support folks, you know, um, you know, work, work-life balance, right? Like, Absolutely. I don't care how often my children come in here and interrupt a meeting because she recognizes I'm a working person with children, right? And so that's free. Having those conversations and telling people, oh, you have kids, don't worry about it. Like, we recognize that is what happens. Oh, fantastic. Wow. Well, let's go ahead. And that's what we're talking about is staff. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Anne-Marie, to lead this part, our favorite part of the show. All right. We love this, um, and our audience loves this. We call this Good News in Parks about great people, and it gives all of our, um, all of our folks, all of our panelists, the opportunity to talk about a great person or team that they work with. Um, and so we're just going to go ahead and jump in with this. I can get this to go. All right. Very good. So I'm so sorry. Hang on just a second here. 
a little disorganized. All right, Jonathan, tell us about Brittany. So this is Brittany White. Brittany White started with us as a seasonal position. You're talking about training up in the department. She's had every role you can think of. Um, Brittany comes to us from Mississippi. And so she brings that Southern love. She's very funny um, in, her, in her way of dealing with challenging times. But Brittany is also uh, like a right hand to me. Um, my previous executive assistant trained Brittany in all facets of this job. And Brittany is now the go-to trainer for everyone in our department. Um, Brittany is special to me um, because I've watched her grow uh, from a young lady now to a woman who is in charge of things, strong in her convictions, and has the brightest future. Um, so I'm very humbled and at the same time appreciative to you that I get the opportunity to honor our own Brittany White. Oh, that's that's absolutely awesome. What a that, that's great. And we we have warned people in the audience, no poaching these team members. Like we yeah. <laughs> you can't take her. I'm creating a culture here where I'm, I'm locking people in, you know, under contract for no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Thanks so much, Jonathan. All right, Lorena, tell us all about Lisa. Yeah, so Lisa, let me just first say that Lisa is a true parks and rec kid. <laughs> yes. Um from when she was little all the way up. Um, she has well over 20 years in the field. She um, currently sits on several boards for USA Softball, Healthy Kids Incorporated, and Ferndale Youth Assistance. Um, she works closely with our state association as well, in parks, where she previously served as the DEI committee um, ch chair, and she still assists with that in some capacity. Um, she, Lisa's been solid since day one. Lisa started about two months after I started as director with uh, Ferndale. And it's really hard to find someone that shares the same enthusiasm and compassion that you do for the field. And she does that. Lisa also refers to us as Batman and, and Robin. And I know she, she always has my back, but it's not about me. It's all about Lisa. Lisa always finds any opportunity to try to elevate our department and city as a whole um, from creating new programs to establishing new partnerships um, while maintaining old ones at the same time. She's always being innovative and filling gaps in our department whenever they arise, whether that's we lose staff members or we have additional programming needs that we need to fill or just people management. Sometimes she takes the, the brunt of it, um, even when she doesn't have to, but she does that, takes one for the team often. <laughs> um, she, um, as you know, our community center is currently closed, like I mentioned earlier. So we mainly work in remotely, but we have, um, we're able to take advantage of our curling club arena to hold our summer camps. So Lisa took it upon herself um, this year to start a roller skating program. So she partnered with an outside roller skating business, an entity who um, is now providing Friday uh, skate trainings to our, um, well, we were utilized them to help train some of our youth, which is all through Lisa. So Lisa, Lisa basically um, solicited the pr training program, hired some youth to get trained to be skate guards and also as DJs. And it's through this outside business that's helping us with this training. And now she offers it to our campers every Friday where we use the youth to do that. And, you know, they're on the ones and twos and have the music going on. And we'll be starting our family skate nights soon, too, um, where we have Friday skate nights. Uh, thanks to thanks to Lisa. And this is not to mention that she also is the deputy director and has all of her other deputy director duties that she has to do. But this is just one of those things where just shows how Lisa goes above and beyond the call of duty to try to service our community in ways that we didn't even think we needed to be serviced. But it's it's like, wow, we really did need skating. People love it. It's great. Keep going. You know, don't stop what you're doing. But um, I just can't talk about Lisa enough um, on everything that she's done and how she's elevated our department as well as elevated herself within a career. In her career while she's with Ferndale, um, she's grown so much and um, and just continues to do do me and the, the department proud. And I just wanted to honor her on today. That's that's awesome. What an amazingly well-rounded person that's uh, an asset to your team. So congratulations, both Lorena and Lisa. All right, Autumn, tell us about this team of yours. 
Well, I, I, I feel like I just need to shout out all of the staff at NRPA. You know, jo Jody did a great job to recognize there's about 60 of us for 60,000 members. Um, and so in that, you know, want to highlight, you know, in in this day and time, right? A month is like a year now post pandemic and to lift up all of the work that so many of our folks did during the pandemic. Like if you think about all the calls around COVID protocols and assisting agencies when they became vaccination sites and what do you do to close down the amount of folks that we supported as people transitioned to mobile rec. That was all these folks consistently um, with love as they were dealing with everything at home. So supporting folks while they were doing the same thing, everyone else. And so I can't talk enough about that, but also with so many new staff coming in, um, creating that culture together and supporting people in learning what happened, you know, like how things go, but also being open to this, like, well, does it have to be that way? Can we improve? Can we be more efficient? Can we change? And so I just really want to lift up our team at NRPA for their love and support of the field. Uh, that is that is absolutely awesome. And I'm not gonna tell you, I, as I've been listening to you talk about all the things um, that that team is doing, all, you know, all the tools and all the work and all the research and the toolkits and the certifications and, the, you know, the annual show every year and education and magazine. I mean, it is amazing. That's the group right there, people. That, mm -hmm. that group of powerful people is doing all of that for, for all of us. So that is absolutely incredible. We just want to um, just really quickly go through a couple of other things. Um, we did get this wonderful um, site. Can you guys see that? Okay. Well, I'm sorry. A little bit of issues with Zoom today. Um, this is a playground that somebody sent in and we thought it'd be great to share on this show because this is such an inclusive space. Um, it's an inclusive family space that was sent in by a watcher in Floyd County, Illinois, uh, Indiana, who has a child with disabilities. And they had a grand opening ceremony in May. This is an 11,000 square foot family space um, designed for children and adults of all abilities. There's a 2,095 square foot splash pad to beat the summer heat up there in Indiana. Um, wow. The whole space has inclusive unitary surfacing so that people can access everything everywhere. Um, there's no limitations to traveling through the space. Um, it has a lot of fun sensory items like sound boxes and zip lines and games. So this watcher, I just wanted to thank Floyd County Parks and Recreation. They raised more than a million dollars in funding from grants and community donations, um, including a $70,000 grant from the Community Foundation of Southern Indiana. Um, and to Sinclair Recreation uh, for designing the space, which they used the seven principles of inclusive playground design to make sure that they thought more, you know, holistically about the whole um, child and, you know, children in wheelchairs, certainly, but children with all sorts of disabilities and adults uh, with disabilities and families. And so this is uh, very much a, a great space that the whole community and surrounding communities are loving as well. So congratulations and thanks for that. Um, wanted to share, since we're on the topic of DEI, um, PlayCore is offering a scholar series of webinars. Um, it's a two webinar series. Um, July 21st, they'll talk about addressing disparities um, in rural America with some learnings from Louisiana. You can see the scholars there that will be speaking about those pictures. They're hilarious. <laughs> Everybody sent in kind of a fun picture. I saw that's really fun. And then in August, using data to address park diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Um, as always, register at education.playcore.com. So know those are coming up. And then uh, join us for Good News in Parks on August 11th, where we'll be talking about innovative ideas from today's change makers. So same sign up site, education.playcore.com. That's where all the series are at. That's where all your um, CEU certificates are stored. Um, so everything is, is housed there. So I um, just wanted to talk about that as well. And Jody, um, I'm gonna leave it on to you girl to close us out here today. Well, I, I can't wait till the next show. We've got some dynamic directors from all over the country coming on next next uh, show. To you all, two words. Sheroes, heroes. That's all there is to it. You are the best in the country. Thank you so much for leading us today and continuing onward, folks. Anne Marie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So inspiring today. We appreciate everybody taking the time into our audience. Thanks for joining us today. We will see you next time. Have a great week.